All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Atticus Live, where we drink beer and talk about boats. Today, we are going to be talking about how to plan a passage on a sailboat, and it's going to be awesome. All right, how's it going, everybody? I am Jordan. And I'm Desiree. And we are newbie cruisers. <laughs> so make sure that with everything that we say today and everything that we always say forever and eternity, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. We are not professionals. And all, and as always, as we go through our talking points, uh, we're gonna try to just bang through all of them. Um, but if you have, so we're gonna open up the floor for general questions after we get through those talking points. But if you have questions or comments while we're going through our kind of outline, we're gonna try to answer them in line and also do in line shout outs. And we're gonna have Dave today, who's DV Zire on YouTube, um, help us uh, kind of stay organized and make sure we're answering everyone's questions. So thank you, Dave, for being our moderator today. We're really up, pumped Dave? to have you. Super uh, excited. <laughs> Dave's joining us from Ireland tonight. Um, thanks for staying awake for us. Um, and if you're at all interested in becoming a moderator, please shoot me a message on my Facebook or on our <laughs> Facebook page at Project Atticus. kind of hers. Which is linked to down below. Um, and as a moderator, we'll make you an honorary patron, which means, uh, among other things, you'll get access to our patron Facebook hangout group where we kind of ask our patrons to steer the ship and help us make decisions and just kind of interact on a more intimate level. Um, so this week we actually asked our patrons <laughs> to name our live stream. So we had some really funny submissions, um, and it seems like we're going to stick with Atticus Live. We had 11 votes for Atticus Live, four for Boats and Beers, four for Atticus Hour. Um, so yeah, this will be officially Atticus Live. So thanks guys for helping us, uh, decide the name for this live stream. Um, you guys were really creative. We had some really funny submissions that we were tempted by. <laughs> I voted for Boats and Beers. I'm yeah. going to be honest. I voted for Atticus Live. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we had some funny ones like Atticus Chatticus, uh, Atticus Schmatticus, and Cruisin' and Bruisin', which we thought were really fun. Um, but yeah, so if you want to uh, get in, get involved in our Patreon page or group, um, go ahead and hop over to our Patreon page and see what see we've got going there. Yeah, it's we've really got all fun. kinds of all kinds of fun stuff for you guys to check out there. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, let's hop into passage making. Oh, so excited. Okay. <laughs> so uh, today again, we're going to be talking about just our um, steps that we take. Uh, to actually plan our passages, plan our cruising itineraries. Um, recently, our plan this year was to try to cross the Pacific this spring. Um, and we have pretty much blown by that timeline. Just because we're going to need another month here in Mexico to get a bunch of projects finished and everything else. So we're not going to make it down to Panama in time you know, to get over to the South Pacific early in the season. So we had to decide what we're going to do for the next year um, so that we can cross the Pacific next spring. And uh, we came up with two options. One is uh, the... Oops, sorry. That is not the... There we go. Okay, so the first option was to sail up to Northern Europe, up that way. Um, and just to give you an idea of what the general idea would be, we would make it over here to the uh, Virgin Islands, sail up for Bermuda, go from Bermuda to the Azores, Azores to the British Isles, and then from the British Isles maybe up to uh, Norway, um, which would be really, really awesome. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we might not do that. Specifically, Atticus is not optimized for cold weather or high latitude sailing necessarily. She's, she's really ready for tropical sailing, but doesn't have any heating, doesn't have any insulation, that kind of stuff. So the other option that we came up with was to do the Caribbean uh, for the next year. And uh, this is a neat old chart that I found. So we're over here, the Yucatan Peninsula, you know, Isla Mujeres right there. So what we're talking about doing is going from here along the south coast of Cuba, along the coast of uh, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and the uh, Lesser Antilles. Now, Desiree and I worked in the Lesser Antilles when we worked on uh, super yachts, so we saw a lot of that area, and we aren't necessarily too excited to get over there because we've seen a lot of it. It's a little more expensive, and there's a lot of cruisers there these days, very crowded. Uh, some of those islands are, are pretty packed. 
But we figured what we can do is we can make it to like the Virgin Islands by around June and uh, start sailing the Lesser Antilles uh, th during the early part of the hurricane season. And I've always considered that area to be fairly good for cruising early in the season because if there's a hurricane coming, you can always just uh, beeline it down to Curacao, which is generally on a beam reach. Um, pretty, you know, pretty easy, quick sail to get out of the uh, way of a hurricane. So that way, in the middle, early on in hurricane season, we probably won't have as many other cruisers out there, and it'd be a little bit more enjoyable for us. Also, the snorkeling would be better. Free diving would be really good that time of year. The water's a little bit calmer. Winds are a little bit calmer. So anyway, those are the two options that we've kind of come up with. Um, can I interrupt you to do yes. some shout outs? Let's just say, hey, Empty Nest Sailing, thanks for joining us. Hey, Derek what's up, Erling. guys? Good evening from Germany. We've got two people from Germany tonight. Thomas Golan, as Sehr always. Gut. <laughs> hey, Saida. Thanks. Jor uh, um, what was I going to say? Tommy is a cutie. <laughs> Sail before sunset. What's up, guys? It is 5 o'clock, although I'm drinking just tonic water and limes tonight. Yeah, me too. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's go on. Yeah, so, uh, so what oh, we're going to do sub today... D-V-R-B. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so... Um, oh, and then I, I did... For and then from the, you know, the southern end of the Lesser Antilles, we would sail west along the northern coast of South America, the ABC Islands. I'm really excited about Colombia. Um, I don't know if you guys saw Sailing Uma's latest videos in Colombia, and everything that we've heard about Colombia is just amazing. You know, the mountains coming down to the sea is something that we're really interested in. And then from there to Panama. So we have a year to circumnavigate the Caribbean, and that's probably what we'll end up doing. But today... We're going to just go over the process from like the inception of the idea, even like the moment we even just come up with the thought like, hey, we could go to Northern Europe, all the way to when we have like a set plan, we've researched everything. We're just going to go over that whole process today. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Fun, awesome graphic number one, <laughs> passage planning step one is cultivate an idea. Boom. Okay, so that's step number one is cultivate the idea. Um, now, we get our ideas from a lot of different sources. Talking to other cruisers is a big one. Also, I, le I read a lot of Cruising World. So Cruising World magazine or any you know cruising magazines are going to give you a lot of ideas on places to go. Um, and uh, so just, and in fact, you, you can kind of talk about how, well, I get real excitable. I get, I don't know if you guys can like tell that from the <laughs> from the live streams. I'm a very excitable person, so I like just talk to Desiree about what's in my brain constantly, and so I'm always coming up with these like, oh, we could sail to Africa, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah. For a while, we were when we were watching Venture Lives, Jordan was convinced we were, we were just gonna sail from Mexico to. Uh, Hawaii and then Alaska. Alaska, <laughs> which Desiree thought. The tropics. <laughs> Desiree thought Alaska was an island. Hey, no, it's I didn't. true. He's that lying. is totally He's... true. Oh, okay. We All got right. a um, water bottle uh, because Jordan interrupts me a lot. So. But I can use it also when you when you insult me. There you go. All right. So. <laughs> There you go. So I'm going to get squirked. All right. Also, Sailing Anastasia says, just discover the live chat. LOL. Cheers, guys. Think about Suriname. I've heard it's absolutely amazing. I will try to hide in there for the hurricane season as well. Very cool. Cool. Yeah, we are trying to collect as many kind of like off the beaten path ideas as possible because we want to see. Uh, we're more into like adventure sailing than, than uh, most ideas. So go on. Yeah. Um, all right. So <laughs> just along that same line. Step number one, cultivate the idea. So once you start talking about it, you know, Desiree kind of like <clears throat> drowns out most of my noise until we start having, until I start like actually consistently talking about the same idea over and over and over again. So we just chat about it. We do a little bit of like general research and decide if, you know, what areas would be areas that we would be interested in going to. So then that leads us to step number two, which is narrow down your options. Um, now, what I mean by that is uh, using a couple of different resources. First thing that we use is World Voyage Planner by Jimmy Cornell. And uh, we're going to be talking about quite a few of Jimmy Cornell's books <laughs> today, um, all of which are actually in the description below. So if you're looking to buy any of these books, use those links. And in fact, 
if you do buy the books through those links, it helps us out as well. So make sure if you do uh, follow up and try and buy some of these, use those links. That, that, that would be really awesome. Um, okay, so World Voyage Planner. So this book is sort of like that first step to doing like hardcore research about a certain voyage. And uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple of images here. So this is from the table of contents uh, of the World Voyage Planner. So you can see if we wanted to check out Northern Europe, we go to the section called Voyages to Northern Europe. And then from there, they break it down to where you would leave from. Um, here, this is actually in the section, Voyages to Northern Europe. And they, Jimmy Cornell kind of breaks down all the places you can go to and from. So what what circuits you can do. And this is really helpful because, all right, so say you, you know you want to go to Norway uh, or Scandinavia, but you're not sure where to go in between, you know, Bermuda and Scandinavia. Well, a chart like this really helps you to figure out, like, what places to stop along the way. And all of those stops are going to be, you know, using the uh, uh, wind and currents to your advantage. Um, so here I uh, then go to the actual, the specific voyage that I'm talking about. So this would be voyages to Northern Europe from the Caribbean. And uh, as you can see, it tells you recommended time of the year, uh, when the tropical storms occur, and then it shows you um, the actual uh, voyage numbers that you would find in the next book that we'll talk about, Jimmy Cornell's World Cruising Routes. So these two books kind of work together on that. And then beyond all of this stuff, he goes into great detail about the, the generalities of the voyage, what to be you should be concerned about. Um, he gives you waypoints. Well, not wait, this book is more, um, th this book in particular is more the, the broad planning side. So just get, just begin to get an idea of when you can do this trip, what to be concerned about in those region in, in that area. And like this book is really big on like kind of helping you brainstorm where you'll go next from there and maybe where you should go before you reach that destination, that kind of stuff. So just broad general topics. And before Jordan moves on to the next book, I just wanted to say, hey, Tom McFarland, uh, Steve Wicht, who is Jordan's dad. What up, big guy? Awesome woodworker. Um, for who else? My mom, Theo, and Ashley Shutter, our wedding photographer. What up? Christopher Michael Lee Gross. What's up, pretty people? Okay. <laughs> cool. So that leads us to the next book, which is Jimmy Cornell's World Cruising Routes. Um, and again, these two books work together. So this is the book that you're going to go to when you're just starting to come up with those ideas and, and kind of nail it down. And then this is the book that you're going to go to for the specifics, like the nitty gritty, like every single aspect of that voyage is going to be in here. Um, this is actually the very first cruising book that I ever bought. I bought this when I was still in college because I was like, I'm, I want to be a sailor and sail around the world. So I bought this book and it was way over my head. But it was fun because I would just, you know, crack it open every now and then and read certain areas and it got me pretty stoked about, you know, someday doing this sort of thing. Okay, so let's show, break into this book a little bit. Um, so, yes, let's go. Okay, so here you go. Yeah. Um, so this is um, from World Cruising Routes, um, and, and World Cruising Routes does it a little bit different because it asks you where you want to leave from, and then, uh, and then the chapters are arranged that way. So this is um, all of your you know, voyages that you can go on leaving from the Virgin Islands. Um, so if I knew that I wanted to go, say, because of, I read World Voyage Planner, I know that I want to go from the Virgin Islands to Bermuda. And you can see that's one of the uh, passages right there going due north. Then I go to the section, um, oh, and then here is that actual passage. Um, going from the Virgin Islands to Bermuda. And he's got all the waypoints. He's got a very in-depth description of that passage. Um, you know, seasonal changes, wind patterns, you know, all kind, everything that you could imagine. Um, and then uh, you go to the section that's routes from Bermuda. And then there you can see places you can go to from Bermuda. You can see the one that goes off to the right goes up to the British Isles. That would be the one that we would take. There you are, Bermuda to Northern Europe. Got everything you need on that. And then uh, routes from the Azores as well, if you wanted to uh, stop by in the Azores. Um, and there you go again. So there's the Azores to, uh, to the British Isles. 
um, and then, you know, so on and so forth, British Isles up to Scandinavia and all that. Um, so that's this book. And this book is, again, this is not light reading, right? Like, <laughs> this is not something that you'd uh, want to pick up for just five minutes here and there. Like, this is serious, thick, informa like dense information. Um, but I highly, highly, highly recommend it. As long as you've got these two books aboard your boat, you can pretty much change your plans at, on a whim and be prepared to, to go just about anywhere. Um, okay, so then after that, um, we go to our next step, which is step three, educate yourself on the region. Um, so what that means is once you've got that passage actually planned, that actual you know trip, and you know everything that you need to know about what to expect and where to go specifically, then we start just learning as much as we can about the region in general so that once we get there, we don't necessarily have to consult these books constantly, but we can actually have like a base knowledge uh, about the area. So the first thing that I do is I break out another one of Jimmy Cornell's books, <laughs> his uh, Ocean Atlas book. Now, all this is, is it's a collection of pilot charts that he's put together and that he's um, sort of organized in a really easy way to, to understand. And real quick, good question. Dave just says, do you have electronic versions of those books also? Um, I don't, mm -hmm. um, but that's a great idea. I mm -hmm. mean, these are big books, mm -hmm. and on Atticus, we have so little room. The only thing I'll say is it is nice to like when it comes to referencing like i don't know there is something nice about being able to whip this thing open but to be perfectly honest it probably worked just as well as an ebook you could zoom around on your laptop or on a on a uh, tablet so no good good point that would definitely be what i would recommend <laughs> zorn 101 says what size bowl do you use to cut your hair on atticus <laughs> that's a that's a good question see i knew i knew it i knew all you guys were just thinking about my hair that's pretty nice huh oh yeah look yeah. at that now i'm trying to i'm starting to get grays so i'm trying to not uh not not let them show as much <laughs> yeah there's actually like a very hip uh, hairdresser for guys on the island and unfortunately they hired a new guy and Jordan was his like first customer so yeah. it was a little butchered but I still I like yeah, it you, you know look, you I think good. it looks all right yeah I like it because I, I like I can get rid of heat very efficiently I transfer heat <laughs> extremely effectively also Eric Hay from Arizona Kara Keys hello from North Carolina off the planet off planet event welcome back off planet <laughs> event what up buddy all right okay and, and also, I just wanted to hop in here and say, um, this is kind of the stage where I start getting involved, because as Jordan was saying before, um, you know, he has all these like grand ideas, and he's kind of the researcher uh, among both of us. Um, the way that our kind of dynamic works is he just gets super into something and then researches the crap out of it. Um, and then I kind of learn through just being next to him all these ideas that he has. So um, he is very excitable. So you know, one week he'll be talking about Ireland, 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 Ireland. <laughs> and I kind of just wait and see if it lasts for like a month. And then once he's telling a lot of people for a month we're going to Ireland, then I start, you know, kind of getting involved at this stage. And something that we didn't mention is that we also use noonsite.com, um, maybe even before we get to this stage or kind of uh, concurrently, um, because Noonsite will kind of tell you if there's like a political problem or if there's any like dangerous uh, or like crime issues or medical issues um, that will just totally like nix an idea. So um, new, we use Noonsite a lot. It's also a really great uh, resource for um, just like anchorages and places to grocery shop and it links to all sorts of different uh, videos and blog posts about the place that you're going to. So that's also a great uh, website if you guys haven't yeah. heard of it. Definitely hey, check it out. What's up, Eddie? How, how you doing, buddy? Eddie Spaghetti? Yeah. Nice! <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, yeah, Noonsight, and ironically, I'm pretty sure Noonsight was started by Jimmy Cornell. So oh. we're, we're just, well, Jimmy Cornell just saw, you know, <laughs> Uh, a whole market that wasn't being served uh, properly. So anyway, no, noon, noonsite.com is awesome, guys. And not only because we learn everything that we need to know about, like, the latest information on customs procedures and, and all the, like, legal stuff, immigration. He also goes into depth about security, like how much uh, safety and security has been an issue in that area recently. Um, all that kind of, like, technical stuff. 
Um, also, Noon Site is great because a lot of people post links to like articles and stuff related to the country that you're researching. And so if you just look to the right and look at all those links, there's normally a lot of really cool videos, articles, blog articles, like photo galleries of the area that you're trying to research. So that's a really, really great resource. And if you're cruising and you're trying to tell your parents that you're going to, if you have overbearing parents or family members back at home, if you're trying to tell them you're going to a region and they're totally freaked out about it, um, it's a really good resource to give them so that they can look uh, at the actual information and crimes reported so that they're a little bit more educated. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so back to the atlas. So this is really comes in handy to learn like just generally what winds to expect and what currents to expect at certain times of the year. And so we'll go over a couple of images here. Um, and while you're finding them, Jason Bowles says, this video brought to you by Jimmy Cornell. That's that's <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we do not get paid anything by Jimmy Cornell, just <laughs> so all you guys know. But I, I, I do have like a man crush on him. So. <laughs> anyway, so this is uh, one of the pages of the pilot charts. So this is the one of the pages that we would have looked at um, if we were planning this uh, transatlantic uh, voyage. Um, and so as you can see, it shows that mid-Atlantic high there. Um, and this is, I believe, for June. Um, and so we would just take a look at it. And here's the Caribbean. So you can see, okay, when you're leaving the Virgin Islands, you know, 90% of the time in June, you're getting easterly winds. You can see what the current's doing, all that. Here's the pilot chart for Northern Europe. Um, so all that stuff is really, oh, um, all that stuff is really great to just start to, like, again, build that foundation of knowledge so that when you're there or when you're crossing the Atlantic, you can remember in your head, like, well, you know, about 15% of the time you do get southerly winds or whatever. So you're not, you, you can anticipate these sorts of situations, especially when you're coastal cruising too, in an area that you're not familiar with. These pilot charts really help you, um, like, become familiar with what to expect. And um, Dave just brought up a good point, and this is kind of like once we also decide where we want to go tentatively, we try to find people who have been there and just kind of pick their brains. So Dave yeah. just says, you really try to make con make contact with somebody on the ground in the place because the truth can be subjective, and Eddie Spaghetti says, or to avoid a certain barber. Good point. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. And did, didn't Jimmy Cornell, uh, did you meet him when he was in Stock Island? I didn't meet him. I, like just like kind of sketchily stared at him from afar <laughs> because he he was coming through with one of his like rallies that he does one something he does now is like cruisers can pay to like join his like little voy you know team voyage on i guess it's called a rally i think and they were stopping in uh, stock island in the in the keys and uh at the marina that we were staying at and so i just kind of stalked him for a while <laughs> stare, I, stared at his boat which is really cool i came home from work and he was just so excited he was like we need to go back right now and yeah. we went and they were gone well and, I, and i'm like tell i'm like hey look over there that's jimmy cornell and people were like who's jimmy cornell i'm like yeah i guess he's not famous necessarily <laughs> um but anyway he is the man um okay so then from there, oh, and then another thing, like so in Isla Mujeres, when people are going to like Cuba or Belize, something that they'll do is get on the cruiser's net and just say like, hey, like we're heading to Belize. Um, anybody out there been to Belize, want to come over to our boat, we'll provide, you know, a bunch of beer. We can just talk about Belize, you know. That's another really good way to get information from people who have actually been there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so... Um, yeah, we were talking about other resources after the uh, well. Right. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna talk about. So at that point, we would buy a cruising guide. Um, now we don't have any cruising guides for Northern Europe. Again, I'm we're really not sure if we're gonna do that trip. But this is our cruising guide for Cuba. Um, and so the cruising guides are, you know, you really don't want to buy them until you're pretty darn sure you're going there because they can be expensive. Um, and they're very specific, right? It's like for one country or maybe a couple of countries. But man, once you have a cruising guide, like these things, if they're well made, can be total lifesavers. Um, one example is when we were cruising the northwest coast of Cuba, there was this 
large protected like body of water that was surrounded by land on all sides and had one entrance on one side and one entrance on the other and they're real narrow channels and I mean it's Cuba so they're not really marked at all one of them had like a stick you know what I mean but you didn't know which side of the stick you needed to go on um, but books like this give you that really accurate information or hopefully accurate um, and so here we'll go and look at yeah, so this is the body of water I was referring to, the Cayo Inez de Soto. Um, and we entered on the entrance on the lower right, and you can see there's a little square there, and exited on the little channel on the left. Um, and then you can see all those different anchorages that the author, Cheryl Barr, recommended. Um, and so this is a close-up on the entrance, um, and you can see she does a great job. She gives you the coordinates for uh, you know where you can kind of point straight down that channel, so coordinates to try to arrive to before navigating through the channel. Um, you can see it shows that there's a stick right there on the outside of the reef on the left-hand side, which was very helpful to us. And then this was the exit, um, which again, very helpful. Real, real narrow cut through the reef and uh, really helped us get through there. But that was a good example too of getting actual uh, people from that region to talk to. We talked about that exit channel with a couple of fishermen that we met in the area, who were the only other people in that area. And uh, luckily we met them and they told us exactly where the stick was in reference to the reef. Um, and I believe that the coordinates that Cheryl Barr had were a, were a little bit off. So luckily because we talked to the fishermen, we were able to, you know, make our way through there no problem. So, and, and that's something that we've learned since we started cruising as well is that you don't really want to trust just one chart. So either sometimes our Navionics charts are better than our Garmin charts. Sometimes uh, our cruising guides are better. Sometimes word of mouth works. So yeah. try to like just get lots of waypoints and try to collect uh, like a cloud of information that yeah. will kind of guide you. <laughs> no, and, and I do really want to stress like something that we've learned is once you're outside of the U.S. and especially in developing countries, the charts are just guidelines. Like you cannot trust them 100% whatsoever. You're going to end up on the bottom. Okay, um, and then... But hold on, I wanted to say hello to my brother, Jason. What's up, buddy? Hey, Jason. Um, he was asking, um, why don't we use digital travel guides to save space? And we are starting to. The problem with uh, a lot of cruising guides like this one is the the market's not huge for it right like they're not selling selling a ton of these books and a lot of the authors are generally a little bit like back uh like they're not used they're not with the current technology a lot of the time so a lot of the time it's hard to find these in ebook style i'm sure that'll change um you know over the the years but uh as of right now, a lot of these are hard to find as ebooks. So, but totally good point. And we do get ebooks for all of our Lonely Planet guides, which Desiree is going to talk about. Yeah, before I go into that, I'm going to just bring up a couple comments here. So, Jason Bowles was saying most of the example photos seem to be for Northern Europe. Is this a sign for which way you are leaning? Um, and really, it's kind of that Jordan read this article in Cruising World about Ireland or Norway. Um, and we were thinking about trying to avoid another tr uh, summer in the tropics if we know we're going to spend a year cruising before we cross the Panama Canal um, and then to do the Pacific Crossing. So we were kind of like thinking maybe colder regions, either going up north to northern Europe or maybe even going around to Brazil and Argentina. Um, but we're, we're, we're pretty much steering away from that idea now just because Atticus is not really built for that kind of... Uh, those kind of temperatures. So it was just a thought experiment that we that we went through. Um, yeah. All right. And so lonely yeah. plant. Yes. Oh, and also, Dave was oh calling me out for interrupting her. Oh, I feel so bad. No, it's all right. It's good. <laughs> I thought it would feel better than than it than it does. <laughs> um, yeah. So th this is the other part of the uh, uh, planning stage that I get really excited about because before I was into sailing I was really into backpacking um, and my favorite resource was always like travel vlogs and travel blogs and especially uh, Lonely Planet um, so at this point once we know we're going to a region I'll go ahead and get the Lonely Planet and just spend hours reading it um, to see what kind of inland excursions we can do and you know the, the nice thing about Lonely Planet 
that cruising guides generally don't do, and this is actually something that I wish cruising guides did more of, is cruising guides don't offer their opinion. Like, the author doesn't offer their opinion much on, say, like, go to this area because you can hike up this mountain and it's awesome. Like, they don't really say that. Like, they're just assuming that you know where you want to go and why, and then they're giving you the information to get there and, and where to anchor and all that. But uh, whereas Lonely Planet is very, you know, has opinions, like they actually say, like, this area is great for this reason. And so that's a part of the research that Desiree really gets into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it feels more like tangible to me. Um, I feel like we're actually going to this place. So I want to start getting involved in the process. Um, somebody was asking what kind of, uh, um, what do you call this thing? Koozie? This koozie. Thing? This uh, is a Yeti koozie. <laughs> and it's awesome. And Yeti. then we also both got um, insulated water bottles, which, again, in the uh, the summer in the tropics is like a lifesaver. Just throw it. If you can find ice anywhere, just throw in a couple of things of ice in there. It just makes the world a lot better. So. And this one's for you, Eddie Spaghetti. We Aww. got this nice Tropic Cinema one from Key West. <laughs> yeah. All right. You want to go on to... Yeah, so right now with our planning... Um, we kind of nixed out the idea of going to Northern Europe. We kind of nixed out the idea of going to Argentina. So we're pretty much going to be exploring the Caribbean. Um, and so we're looking, like we said, again, for kind of more off the beaten path places. We're more excited about kind of like adventure, waterfalls, hiking, biking, uh, climbing, um, and then as well as uh, a lot of um, kind of cultural experiences. I love speaking Spanish. Um, my mother's from Honduras, so I've been having a really fun time kind of improving um, and meeting people. Um, so yeah, we're definitely excited about Southern Cuba, uh, the Dominican Republic, and then Colombia right now. Yeah. But, you know, like we were saying at the beginning, I am a little bit more excited about doing the, oh, here we go, the Lesser Antilles because we can do it at the beginning of hurricane season. So all, a lot of those insured boats are going to be getting out of there. Um, the snorkeling will be better, just a little bit less crowded. I think that'll be nice. Um, and if you guys didn't catch what we were saying earlier, um, the reason that I think that it's okay for us to cruise the Lesser Antilles in the beginning of hurricane season is because you've always got that option of a beam reach all the way down to Curacao, which is south of, generally south of the hurricane belt. Um, and uh, so to me, that's almost like an eject cord that you can just pull at all times. Over here where we are, you might think that you could do that. In Isla Mujeres, you could sail like due south for the Rio. The problem with that is the Yucatan current if you want to stay out of the current, you've got to stay real close in shore. You've got to stay like at times like within a hundred feet of the coastline, um, and that you just can't do safely at night. So that means that you can only sail during the day, and that makes you you know not be able to get down to the Rio in a day or two. It's going to take you a couple of days. Um, so there, there's just no good options to real quickly jump out of the way of a hurricane from Isla Mujeres, whereas in uh, the Lesser Antilles, you can just boom, sail due south. That's almost always a beam reach at that time of year. Um, and then, you know, a couple days and you're, and you're, and you're totally safe. Um, so, and we'd love to hear what you guys have to say um, about that plan, as well as uh, if you guys have any suggestions for off the beaten path uh, places in the Caribbean. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we didn't really want to do a whole season in the Caribbean was because it's just getting more and more crowded and because we keep hearing people tell us the same thing over and over again, which is, man, you should have been here 15, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, we're both kind of itching to get somewhere where people don't say that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but now that we're, you know, now that we have to be here for a year, I'm pretty excited about it. We're, I'm really excited about the southern coast of Cuba. Cuba is super cool. Uh, DR, everyone says, is awesome, and then Colombia. So let us know what you guys think. Yeah, Eddie Spaghetti was saying, uh, there's your new business. Uh, you're the next cruising guides. And actually, I've been thinking about that, trying to... Um, I'm getting excited about the idea of doing, like, a cruising... Uh, like, top ten things to do as cruisers in the Yucatan, for example. So I haven't really seen many videos like that. A lot of the videos about cruising are just, like, people's stories or they go through their adventures as they're sailing and they mention places, but it's not like a comprehensive like, okay, do this, 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 this. So I'm really excited about that idea. I'd be curious to see if um, you guys would be excited about something like that too. 
Um, mm -hmm. Russell mm -hmm. Frazier on Facebook and YouTube says, Boca del Toro for surfing in the winter is awesome. You can get a panga to take you anywhere. Um, and we're not really surfers yet. <laughs> um, it's definitely on our We'd bucket like list. So, um, and yeah, we were, we do have Boca del Toro on our list as well. So we'd like to hit that up. We were actually thinking about um, getting married there initially when we left the United States uh, and after Jordan proposed, as you might have seen in our latest episode. Um, so uh, we ended up in Isla Mujeres instead. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Let's do the Atticus chug of the Atticus um, most epic comments of the week. We had to choose two this week because there are, there are two really good ones. <laughs> All right. So, oop, that's not the right button. Uh oh. Okay, we're having uh, we're having technical difficulties here. Okay, uh, go ahead, Desiree, start talking, and I'll I'll get this thing on. Um. Okay. There. So. I think you were going to mm. get this one. <laughs> okay, so Marty Handley, that you win the most epic comment of the week. It's a little bit long, guys, so bear with me. Been on this ride since the first release of the first video. I was so bummed when there was a long break in the videos. I thought there was no more, and then suddenly a new Atticus video, jubilation and dancing in one of the restaurants I run. My employees <laughs> thought I was crazy. My wife loves your videos, and I love you guys for that. She was a little hesitant about my dream of a cruising lifestyle, but thanks to you guys, she's all in, and we're saving every dime, researching boats, and she's learning how to swim. You got me right off on the... Right, you got me right off the bat, but you have given her her the dream, and for that, I am truly grateful. So cheers so, to you, Marty, and your wife. You're <laughs> awesome, Marty. We really appreciate that. That really gives us a ton of like energy to keep going. So yeah, Atticus Chug to you, Marty. Woo. Okay, and comment then number two. comment number two. Just cracked us up. Really good. I, I know what he says. Gosh. So it was our last video during the proposal. And, um, oh, I forgot what his name was, though. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, Colin says, awesome. I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> Congratulations to you, too. I don't know if you guys had older siblings growing up, but my brother always tried to pull that stuff on me. <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, while you can kind of look at some questions to answer, we had a drawing or we had a contest on our Facebook page. Um, we had a bunch of pictures from our uh, underwater dives and snorkels in Key West, and we had people identify the, the species. And we have nine people, nine winners this week, so we're going to... Oh, um, that's right. <laughs> What's that? Uh, Facebook. Yes, okay. All right, so those are our winners. Uh, Thomas Golan, who's my brother, is in there twice because he did win twice. He wanted to make sure I'm not cheating. Oh, I did see that yeah, name. Don't, don't look. <laughs> okay. The winner, oh my gosh. <laughs> the winner is Thomas Golan. <laughs> Nepotism, man. Nice. <laughs> oh, Good job, man. Tommy. Well done. <laughs> yeah. You deserve it. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, if you, if you want to get uh, oh, involved... Colin's here, by the way. Colin, thanks for the hey, awesome Colin. comment, buddy. Really appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. If you guys want to check out our Facebook page, we've got some uh, upcoming contests coming up this week. We're doing a caption this photo. So uh, if you want a chance to win a koozie like this one from our wedding, whoops, um, go ahead and try to caption one of our photos. Tommy, I guess I'll send you a koozie, even though you already have one. <laughs> but yeah, guys, we're, we're doing a lot of really fun stuff on the Facebook page. So Definitely go check that out. We're doing lots of fun, like, fish identification challenges and got a lot of little stories that we're able to tell that you can't really get elsewhere. So, really fun. Definitely check it out. And Bob Dallas was, or Dallas Bob was asking, what camera are you using now? It's the best quality picture I've ever seen in live broadcasts. Also, what is the pirouette about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pirouette was... Uh, was kind of a funny one, huh? Well, you better watch out. I might do more of that. Um, anyway, no. Um, the uh, the camera is actually just the webcam on my computer. It's an Asus uh, Windows computer. We're actually getting a, uh, a webcam? better uh, webcam here coming up soon, so that'll be really exciting. We're also going to start trying to record audio on one of our actual audio recorders, so we're going to have better audio, better video. And what we're even going to try and do is take the audio from these live streams and turn them into a podcast. So um, we we don't have a whole lot of time for doing that kind of stuff right now, but if you guys are interested in that, if that's something that you would like, please let us know. And if enough people are telling me that that's something they want us to focus on, then I'll, I'll start prioritizing it. Cool. 
Wait, what were you just talking about? I was the reading. The podcast. Oh, okay, cool. Because what? Because other people are saying the video cruising guide is a good idea, which I'm excited about too. Cool. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. What else do we have? Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, we'll go ahead and just um, answer anything you have. And then in the meantime, we had another question about Cuba. Our latest video was um, sailing to Cuba and Havana and Jordan's proposal on our first day there. Um, and Rick Rodriguez, Rodriguez asked, congratulations, would love to have some info on what you had to go through as far as formalities goes for a U.S. flag boat going to Cuba, thinking of sailing there soon. Uh, so we basically had to file form 3300, um, and I think Jordan has it right there. Yeah, so on the left is actually <laughs> our uh, approved permit from the Coast Guard. After we submitted the form on the right, that is the form itself, CG3300. Um, and you can see they just, they asked for a bunch of silly stuff. Um, it really, to, in my opinion, they're just trying to make it kind of difficult. Like they're trying to create hoops for you to have to jump through. Um, because the whole thing, the whole process is incredibly simple. And in fact, as you, the main like issue is if you look there at the towards the bottom uh, we wrote in journalist says my OFAC license number for this voyage is and we actually didn't get an OFAC license number um, because you don't need to do that anymore so you guys may have heard that um, there's 12 general licenses that you can fall under for uh, legally going to Cuba as an American um, one of them is like, you know, doing health work, another is education, journalism, uh, cultural uh, exchange or something like that. And each license, each requirement has a guideline for what it takes for you to actually fall under that category. Um, the, co the, the government can inquire anytime within like five years of you going. They can actually do an investigation and you have to be able to prove that you did fall under that general license. So for us, um, we went under journalism because I was going to write an article for Cruising World, um, which is going to be coming out soon. And then we've got another article that I'll be writing shortly about the experience also. And um, I've linked below to a really good blog post about everything you need to know to get into Cuba. And I forgot to, but I will also put the um, officer's name and his telephone number that you can call with any questions. He's probably going to hate me for this, but it was nice to have his number. And he was very sweet and answered any of our questions while we were filling out the form. Yeah, Private First Class Wilson, man. But... Um, <laughs> So, but real quick, I did want to say, um, don't be discouraged. Like, I mean, I, depending on your level of, you know, I don't know, it, how much you want to push the limit with the U.S. government, um, from what I understand, they're not really investigating um, many of these j claims going to the, going to Cuba. So if you just put down um, cultural exchange or whatever it is, um, they don't actually ask for proof that you're doing that. Coast Guard document 3300 is actually just like informing the Coast Guard and Homeland Security of what you're going to be doing. They don't actually require proof that you fall under that general license. So if you're willing to kind of roll the dice and hope that the government doesn't actually uh, investigate your claim, then uh, then you can totally go. The main problem, and this is such a bureaucratic, silly thing. Eddie, awesome. Yeah, thank thanks, you, bro. Eddie. That's, That's really cool, man. <laughs> Eddie thanks. also just said, you, you guys are too pretty for podcasts. <laughs> well, I make that, that, especially this haircut. But anyway, uh, so, but I was just going to say, um, uh, the main issue with going through this process legitimately <laughs> is that you have to give them the exact date that you'll be crossing into Cuban waters, which like if you're waiting for a weather window, you might wait for a week or two or three out of Key West or the dry Tortugas. Um, so it's really silly that you have to give them the exact day that you're going to be going in. If you don't go that day, you have to ask for an expedited uh, uh, change to the document and that can take multiple days and your, your weather window is gone. So you either have to be kind of shady about it or you have to be real lucky um, and luckily, we were able to change our date last minute. The guy, you know, PFC Wilson got back to us right away, and we were able to go. Um, also, you can only be there for two weeks if you're returning to the United States. Um, 
and that's because otherwise you have to get like an export permit. Um, if you're moving on from to other countries after the United States, that doesn't matter so much. But if you aren't going back to the United States from Cuba, you actually have to write like a letter explaining why uh, to the Coast Guard. All right, so Sail Libra just said they're heading back to Cuba next week. The permit was approved today. Woo! -hoo! Seventh trip for Libra. That's awesome. What part of um, Cuba are you guys going to be sailing? Um, yeah. Um, but uh, somebody else was asking a good question a second ago. Do you have any questions over here? No, I had one a little bit up. It was by Rob. Rob said, "Do you guys have a time frame on how long you plan to live aboard?" Um, and Honestly, we plan on living on a boat for at least the next 10 years of our life. Um, we are happy with Atticus right now. Um, we'd like to circumnavigate on Atticus. Um, and then uh, if we ever want to get into higher latitude sailings, we'd like to buy a boat um, that's a little bit farther along the refit process, maybe a little bit bigger um, and more equipped for um, high latitude sailing. So that's kind of on our bucket list. But yeah, our plan is to be sailing uh, and seeing the world for as long as possible, have a have a kid in the next couple of years, raise her on the boat, <laughs> little boat girl. <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, and uh, uh, Waukesha pilot, pilot, sorry I can't say it. Waukesha pilot says just liked and sub. Thanks, buddy. Glad to have you. And then Sail Libra was saying that they're heading back to Cuba next week. Permit was approved today. I just read that one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyway, that's exciting, Sail Libra. Hopefully, we'll see you there because we're we're heading there within a month. Um, oh, they're going just for a couple of days. Um, anyway, okay, cool. Um, so, what do we have, Desiree? Huh, sailing Anastasia says, "I wonder how that will work for me since I'm Romanian, but my boat is registered in the U.S. I guess I won't need that form." That's a good point. Boy, I, yeah, <laughs> that's that's a tough one. I don't know. We'll have to bring a know. ringer for that one. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right, let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, any other questions we want to answer? Um, well, Ashley Shutter is in the house. What's up, hey, Ashley? Ashley. Um, she's talking about raising a kid on the boat and how that would be exciting. And mm. I'd be curious what you guys think about that. Um, I know that Eddie Spaghetti, our good buddy from Key West, he has raised his awesome child on uh, Milo, Milo on, on a boat. Um, and we met quite a few uh, cool boat kids and families in Key West. Um, Atticus is da pretty darn small, but so are babies. <laughs> so <laughs> and, I, I, well, sorry. I was going to say, um, and Rob is asking, where are you right now? And we are in Isla Mujeres, and we uh, live on a dock that is part of a um, hotel that is kind of under construction in the process of reopening with a new owner. Um, so we do an exchange of work for our rent, and um, luckily no one's around today, so we get the whole bar to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, um, oh, <laughs> Ashley was raised on a boat. Did I know oh, that? I didn't know that. That's yeah, cool. cool. My mom just says, I, I say no raising kids in a sailboat. <laughs> okay, so that's one boat for no. <laughs> Does anybody else think it's a good idea? <laughs> And then Thomas Golan <laughs> says, I too was raised on a boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, do you see this one? Yeah, okay. I think I just answered both of those. Where we are? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, so um, I guess our last week's episode was Jordan proposing. Um, and we have since gotten married, so um, we planned. We ended up in Isla Mujeres, and as you guys watch the next couple of episodes, you'll kind of catch up to how we got here. Um, we had a little bit of a traumatic event that kind of changed our plans, um, and so we've been in Isla Mujeres since then. And uh, once we got here, we realized it's a huge wedding destination place. So I actually met a wedding planner, and she hired me to do social media for her company. Um, and then eventually we did a little bit of a work exchange to help to have her help us with our wedding. So that was really fun. And again, this is a koozie from from the wedding. Eek! <laughs> I'm really bad at that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's see. How does health insurance work? That's a great question. Um, uh, and actually, that was a question from last week from Parker Misko. Um, well, first talk about how expensive it is, how cheap it is. Oh, right. So the way that our, kind of like our philosophy with health insurance is you can buy packages um, while you're sailing around the world or even traveling around the world for health insurance. 
Um, but we've just read that it's uh, very limiting, like you have to go to certain um, doctors and um, it's very expensive. So um, we decided to start cruising without uh, health insurance or boat insurance. Um, and uh, it's been really easy so far in uh, Isla Mujeres. We're really close to Cancun, so it's actually a medical tourism destination. So um, I actually had some weird issues, uh, two weird issues since we've been here. Um, and I, I went to see two specialists in Cancun. Uh, each visit was, the first visit was $50 to a gynecologist. The second visit was a spinal specialist, and I think he charged me $80. Um, and then if I ever need, I needed x-rays for my back, um, and that cost me about $12 at the local hospital. Um, $12. <laughs> yeah. So we've, I mean, as long as we're sailing in places where you can find, uh, you know, if you're closer to a big, bigger hub and you can kind of get looked at and see the best doctor there, then it's, it's really worked out for us so far. Yeah. We, we've actually heard a lot of really good things about the, uh, medical tourism industry in Colombia as well. I think they've got one of the best kind of medical um, uh, fields in in this part of the world. Um, so yeah, it's definitely significantly cheaper uh, once you're outside of the United States. You'd be amazed at how much more expensive health insurance or health care is in the in oh the US. whoa thank hey, you sail libra, libra. Right, you're awesome. the man thank you that's so sweet <laughs> and he was saying and i thought this was great sail libra was saying thanks for answering all the questions for people looking forward to following your new adventure feel like i met your whole family at el milagro <laughs> good fun so el milagro is is this little hotel slash marina next door to us and when we had the wedding we had like 50 of our closest family members and friends all staying there we rented the whole place out and uh, it's amazing what you can do with a relatively small budget in like developing countries, you know what I mean? Um, but anyway, it was, a, it was a blast and a lot of the sailors here got to meet our family. And so I, Sail Libra, awesome man, yeah, thank, thank you, you dude. Yeah, thank you, that's really awesome of you. Um, and I also meant, wanted to mention that um, Ashley Shutter was our um, Facebook or our photographer for our wedding, and she found us on YouTube and got in touch with me on Facebook and said, "Hey, I'm a sailor. I follow your vlog, and I want to shoot your wedding." And I said, "Yes, please, please do that." <laughs> so she was awesome. Came out with a team of four people. Uh, they were like photography ninjas, and she actually just uh, sent me the link to our wedding album. So I'm gonna go ahead and post a couple photos to our Facebook page and then the full album to our uh, patron uh, hangout page. So that'll be coming soon. Um, somebody just had a really good question. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, Sailing Anastasia says, boats, uh, kids on a boat are smart, very well educated, much smarter than many coming out from, an, uh, from a university. Plus no one would beat them on history and geography. So big yes for kids on a boat. And yeah, yeah we've seen that. Every kid that we've met, a cruising kid is just so mature for their age. And they can entertain themselves really well, so we're we're excited for the adventure. Sorry, mom, <laughs> you have to come out and visit us. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, uh, what was the other? But no, I mean, more on that though. And guys, like, I, I this is actually a really interesting topic. So, if you guys have any other questions or comments about it, I, I'm really interested. We're we're seriously debating doing this in the next year or two. You know, trying to have have a little boat baby, but um, I mean, I in my opinion, I think that like raising a kid on a boat while traveling would would have a lot of challenges, but would have a lot of really cool uh, good things about it. I mean, not only would the child learn about other cultures, but they they would have this intrinsic understanding that I think people like myself, like I had to learn that like people all over the world are you know finding happiness no matter what their situation you know what i mean and and that's something that i had to like do a lot of traveling and a lot of like searching to like realize like a kid raised on a boat traveling from country to country developing countries developed countries first world third world i mean they would have that fundamental understanding as like a base layer of their of their worldview and that in itself is so valuable, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's fun seeing boat kids try to interact. Because whenever a boat kid sees another boat kid, in our experience, they just, like, run to each other. Um, and it's really cool to see. Um, we had a, a boat friend who had a little girl, April, I think she was 
eight years old or maybe ten years old. Super cute. But she and this girl, Sophia, just hung out, could not speak to each other at all because one didn't speak English and one didn't speak Spanish. But they just, like, stare at each other and smile for hours and, and then like, have a great time. play with dolls and stuff. I mean, yeah. they, they had a great time. Yeah, so that's a really good life skill, in my opinion. Um, Jason Bowles was asking, have you had any issues with not having boat insurance, marina or boat haul out turning you away? That's a good question. The only problem we've had so far is, um, it wasn't really a problem, but to get a um, permit to visit a uh, place called Isla Contoy, um, which is like a bird sanctuary outside of Isla Mujeres, you had to, you had to have boat insurance, um, but I just told the lady we didn't have it, and then she said it would not be possible, but then she wrote me the next day and, and processed our permit. So that was our only real problem that we've had so far. Hopefully we don't run into any other issues. Yeah. Um, but no, to be honest, I, I don't think that in outside of the first world, I don't think you have that issue. Um, also, in like Key West... Uh, the marina that we stayed at there, they only required that you have liability insurance, um, which, I mean, you can get for extremely cheap. I, I think it was like our Geico insurance was mm. like $100 for the year. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't like bad that. when we were in Key West. Maybe even less. Um, AW asks, do you speak multiple languages? Um, I speak Spanish probably at like an eighth grade level. Um uh, maybe like a high schooler when I've had a couple glasses of wine and I'm a little bit more confident. <laughs> um, and then Jordan's Spanish is getting uh, pretty good. He's it's able to kind of small talk and banter with the guys from the boatyard, which has been interesting to yeah. watch. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely where I started learning the most was working in the boatyard with these guys, you know, because you find yourself in situations where, like, you have to get your point across. And... You know, even though you're not learning the academic way of saying these things, you're learning to, you know, quite literally get by, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I probably sound like a first grader, <laughs> but like in like a, a challenged first grader at that. But still, like I'm able to pretty much get uh, any point that I need to get across. And to people. people are excited when you try. So when we went to Laos, for example... Um, that was our first international trip together before Jordan convinced me to quit our jobs on super yachts and buy Atticus. Um, we went to Laos and we had like an eight hour river cruise to get to one of the little villages we were trying to get to. And, you know, instead of just chatting and doing nothing, we spent eight hours trying to teach ourselves, um, like 12 different phrases, uh, numbers, um, and yeah, basically that was it. It took us a long time. And it was funny because we were quizzing each other in the back of the boat and there were two captains and the relief captain just kind of started cracking up and eventually came back to the back of the boat with us and started correcting our pronunciation and telling us how to say things for real. And then they were kind of fighting over like who could drive the boat uh, because the other one wanted to talk to us. And then by the time we got to the village that we were that was our destination, they wanted to have both of us over to their houses to kind of like show off these two funny, you know, they call them phalongs in, uh, in Laos, which means like long nose, <laughs> yeah. uh, what they call tourists. So anyways, I also speak a random language, which is probably never going to be applicable to our travels. I speak, I speak Nepalese, um, because in college I lived in, uh, India in a, a Nepalese community. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Mabel Chu Nep Nepali uh, Alikati. <laughs> yeah. No, but I still remember uh, that one Lao phrase, Laka Peng Lai. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Laka Peng Lai, mm -hmm. which means uh, uh, that is far too expensive. Yeah, that always got a laugh. <laughs> that was great. If you, when you were trying to barter to get get that gringo price <clears throat> down, you know? Yeah. Like, that helped a lot. Like, they all, the, 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 uh, the store owners would always get a kick out of that. Yeah, I had a friend who was a, a travel blogger, and she said she learned in every language how to say, he's buying my beer <laughs> in every country she went to. So that's a good trick, too. Mm -hmm. um, what and, well, I was, sorry, you can spray me real quick. But I was okay. just going <laughs> to give a, sh <laughs> like a, a quick point. Um, I was going to ask, so I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation about talking about you know having kids on the boat. I, I'm, we're seeing. I'm seeing a lot of people being, you know, fairly positive about it. Mrs. Golan is definitely not into it. Um, 
Desiree's mother. Um, <laughs> but I did want to ask, um, is there, so this is the main question I have is, at some age, you know, I think it's important that a kid, like, starts to have a lot of time socializing with kids their own age. Like, a lot of time. Like, the majority of their time. Um, I think that, you know, through a lot of the development for kids, it's great to have, you know, them, us, having adventures, exploring, meeting kids here and there. Um, would you guys say that, in your experiences, there's a certain age where like that socialization, that spending lots of time with lots of other kids becomes really important. Uh, we've talked about maybe at like nine or 10, like we'd have to settle down for a while, maybe, you know, keep the boat somewhere where we could just do weekend trips, but then stay somewhat static. Um, I'd be really interested to, to hear what you guys have to say about that. Yeah, Ashley Shutter was saying, making friends was sometimes tough and roots are important at some point. So those are good points. Um, Wokesha Pilot asks, do you guys follow any other sailing channels? Um, and we actually try not to because um, we're trying to kind of stay in our own heads, like in an editing bubble, so we're not trying to, so that we're kind of fresh. Um, that being said, we do follow vlogs of people that we've met. So we've met Zingaro, and we follow him. We've met Sailing. And they're awesome. They're awesome. We've met Trio Travels. We're in love with uh, Krista, Brad, and Cole. Cole's like an amazing boat kid. And he's one of the reasons that we are so, you know, stoked about uh, about having a boat kid. Yeah, and then we also watched Venture Lives. We haven't met them, but they're so awesome. We feel like we have met them. <laughs> yeah, they've got a really cool style. Um, I will say that when, when we were refitting Atticus, I didn't have this philosophy of not watching cruising channels, you know, because I think it is important to not be too... I don't know, like influenced by by other people doing similar things, and um, but so when we were doing the refit, the one channel that had me watch an episode mm. after episode was White Spot Pirates. Yeah. And like someone put it really well the other day in in the live feed, they're saying, "I love like seeing what kind of trouble she's gonna get herself into and how she's gonna get out of it." You yeah. know, like it was that that's exactly it, man. Like every time you're like, "How is she gonna fix this?" And, uh, but, and she does such a great job of, like, making each episode end on, like, a cliffhanger, so you want to watch the next one. Especially, like, her earlier episodes, she was doing something that a lot of other ceiling channels weren't, which is making relatively short episodes. Um, I'm not sure why most ceiling channels make such long episodes. I think it might have something to do with the YouTube algorithm. I think that, like, the amount of time that people end up watching, even if it's not nearly the whole episode, is a good thing. But anyway, I loved her style of doing relatively short videos because I wanted to keep watching. Mm -hmm. And then we don't, I don't, uh, we haven't seen SV Totem's vlog, if they have a vlog, but um, before we, one, I think before we bought Atticus, we were following her blog. So her yes, Facebook. Or her Facebook. And yeah. reading a lot of her articles. Definitely good information there. Um, DV Zire Dave also has his own YouTube channel. Uh, he was started out being like a fisherman, outdoorsy camper kind of guy. Um, had a, um, I think, I don't remember what you said, your first uh, sailing blog. Maybe Wicked Salty came up in your feed. And then you got into boats. And then uh, Dave bought a um, project sailboat. So you can watch him. Uh, refitting his boat. Yeah, that's going to be exciting, Dave. I'll be real <laughs> curious to, to hear how that's going. Yeah, yeah. All right, so if you guys have enjoyed tonight's live stream, you can always text uh, Atticus to 43506 so that you'll never miss an episode. We'll send you a text uh, notification. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jordan's going to talk about how excited we are for having Dave moderate today. Oh, Dave. <laughs> Okay, Dave, you are the man, dude. Uh, we really appreciate that. If any of you guys out there want to become moderators, please let us know. Um, if you do become a moderator, like Dave, you get to become a um, honorary, patron. honorary patron. That's right. And uh, one of the coolest things that you get if uh, by becoming a patron is, again, getting par to participate in our patron hangout group on uh, on Facebook where we upload all kinds of really cool stuff. It's a really tight-knit community and we like we were saying before we like to you know kind of allow our patrons to steer the ship and help us make a lot of the different decisions that we have to make. So if that's something that you're interested in, go head over to patreon.com/projectatticus and uh, yeah.
All right, and also tune in next week at 6 p.m. Uh, we actually don't know what our top is, it, topic is going to be yet. So um, once this video is published, please comment in the published video on any ideas that you would like us to cover for next week's live stream. And we will see you next week at 6 p.m. All right, guys. You guys are all awesome. And, uh, man, this was a good time. So we will see you guys next